Hi everyone, in Chapter 8 we're going to start looking at inventories. So we're going to be looking at the journal entries related to inventory, how to determine how much inventory that we sold cost us, and some new um, ways of valuing inventory. So inventory of course refers to the assets a company intends to sell in their normal course of business. That's how they make profit. Okay, has in production for future sale or uses currently in production and its goods to be sold. Inventory is an asset, remember, and cost of goods sold is the expense that we use when we sell goods. So we always move the cost of the goods out of inventory when they're sold and into the expense cost of goods sold. There are two major types of inventory systems depending on the type of company. A merchandising company, which is what we're going to mainly focus on, only has one inventory account because they purchased finished goods from wholesalers and retailers and resell them to their customer. So the amount that will be in our merchandise inventory asset account will be the actual purchase price of the inventory plus any other costs necessary to get goods in the condition and location for sale. So what that means also is shipping costs that we may have to pay in order to get our inventory to our location. The other type of company dealing with inventory are manufacturers. And manufacturers are actually producing or making the products that will be sold to the wholesalers and retailers. They have three different um, asset inventory accounts. The first are raw materials. So this is where they store the cost of items that will be used to make the product before it's even put into production. The next inventory account will be work in process. So in this account, we'll collect all the costs of making the product while we're making it. Some of it could be from the raw materials, labor, and overhead costs. And that's where we store those costs while the item is being made. When the item is finished and ready to sell, the cost, total cost of making that item are moved to the finished goods asset. So it's a little bit more complex in a manufacturing environment. We're going to deal with a merchandising environment in our discussion. Okay, so this slide then again talks about the manufacturing process. So I kind of went over it. I'll do it one more time. Remember, raw materials represent the cost of components purchased from suppliers that will become part of the finished product. So computer chips, memory modules that go into computers produced by Hewlett Packard. Work and process are where we store the cost of products that are started but not yet complete. Included in the inventory account will be the cost of raw materials to make a particular computer um, while it's in process, the cost of labor and manufacturing overhead. So partially completed computers in the assembly line of Hewlett Packard will be those costs associated with those items are stored in the work in process inventory account. And then when the goods are finished, the costs are then completed or I'm sorry, the costs are then transferred into the completed inventory account, which is called finished goods. So computers produced by HP that are intended for sale to customers, all costs associated with them will now be collected in the finished goods account. And there's an example of Intel's disclosure of their various inventory accounts. And there's a picture of, of uh, how these amounts transfer. So when we buy raw materials, we debit the raw materials inventory account. And then when we put take materials out and put them into production, the cost of the ones that are in production are put into the work in process. Labor that is being um, utilized during the production is transferred into work in process and so our manufacturing overhead so all other costs to make the product.
when the product is finished being made, so we debit those the account work in process while it's being made. When it's finished, we take the total cost of making that that's in work in process, credit it, and transfer it into the finished goods inventory account. When that is sold, the finished goods inventory account is credited and cost of goods sold is debited. Now, we're going to focus on a merchandiser, but we want to introduce you to that manufacturing environment. We're first going to look at um, perpetual inventory systems. There's actually two different ways to account for your inventory. And the inventory system just tells us when to make journal entries related to inventory. The perpetual system is continually being updated. So whenever there's a purchase, sale, or any type of change in inventory, it is recorded on that day. So this allows management to determine the goods on hand on any date and the number of items sold during a period. So take a look. Lothridge Wholesale Beverage Company purchases soft drinks from producers, sells them to retailers. The company begins 2021 with inventory of $120,000 $120, in their inventory account. The following information relates to transactions during 2021. The company purchased additional soft drink inventory that cost $600,000. They had sales for all for the year all on account totaling 820,000. The cost of the soft drinks they sold were 540,000. Lothridge uses the perpetual inventory system. So what that means is a journal entry is made for items one, two, and three when they happen. After, um, at the end of the year, the system indicates that the cost of inventory on hand is $180,000. So what are the journal entries to record this? Well, the beginning inventory is just the inventory balance at the beginning of the year. But during the year when they purchase 600,000 in inventory on account, they will debit the inventory account, credit accounts payable. Also, when they sell the goods, they first credit sales revenue for the selling price, 820,000. Since these were sold on account, they will debit accounts receivable, 820000 just like we would any sale on account. But also on the day of the sale, they must credit the inventory account for the cost of the stuff was, that was sold and then debit the expense account, account cost of goods sold. Why do we do that? Well, when the company buys inventory, they own it. It's an asset. But when it sells, it transforms from an asset to a cost of doing business. So in order to make the revenue of 820,000, they had to incur the expense 540,000 to buy that inventory. So that's why we debit cost of goods sold, which is an expense account and credit the inventory. Nearly all major companies use perpetual inventory systems to maintain a record of inventory transactions. Technological advances help reduce the burden of physical inventory counts and manual record keeping, which we once had. Automated systems allow for continuous tracking of inventory. Things like barcode scanning and radio frequency identification tags help a company maintain their inventory constantly. So what does this mean? Well. Sorry, I needed a drink. Okay. Um, 30 years ago, when I was learning this stuff in intermediate accounting, I didn't learn the perpetual inventory system. It wasn't used. Why not? 30 years ago, when you went to a store and went through the checkout, there was a conveyor belt, but the clerk would actually pick up the item you were buying, look for a little sticker on it, that had its price on it, its selling price, and they would manually enter the numbers into the register. When a register receipt was printed, it was just a whole bunch of numbers. It was the numbers that the clerk had typed in, kind of like when you use a desktop calculator with a printer. 
That's what you got. So you don't know what you were charged for what items and the company didn't know which items they sold when they made the sale. So they couldn't remove the inventory. It's called the periodic. But with the dawn of technology, I still remember it was like 1987. I was here at LCC and one of my friends came in and said, I saw a talking cash register. We were like mortified. What do you mean a talking cash register? There's no such thing. Now, somebody's standing there doing the, a voice, a computer voice. They go, no, really. I don't know what it is. There's some kind of light coming out of the counter now. And when you put your item over it, it says what, how much it costs. It, it says how much the, the price is for it. That was barcode scanning. And that's what we have now. So now the computer system through identification codes knows exactly what item was sold. Well, not exactly, but they know by the barcode the name of the item that was sold. So they can remove inventory as they sell it. Oh, okay, we sold a coffee cup because when we scanned it with the barcode scanning, it said we just sold a coffee cup charging the customer $5. The periodic system works a little differently. We don't record the removal of inventory every time we sell something. What we would do is wait till the end of the year, count what's left, and then determine what was everything we could have sold, what's still here, this is what's sold. And instead of having a journal entry debiting cost of goods sold and crediting inventory after each sale, we would just have one journal entry at the end of the year for all the cost of the goods that were sold. So it's a little bit different system. So the journal entries and accounts used are a little different too. In a periodic system, we use temporary accounts. So these accounts are always closed at the end of the year. Um, whenever we purchase merchandise, we used a purchases account. Instead of debiting inventory, we debit purchases. Whenever an item is returned, we'll credit a contra account purchase returns. If, a, if we pay for a bill early and take a discount, we would credit an account called purchase discounts. We'll show you these. And if we have to pay to have our goods shipped to us, we debit an account called freight in. So we use different accounts to track those items related to our inventory. In the perpetual system, we use the inventory account for all that. So what we would do at the end of the year is we would say, what was the cost of the inventory we started with? What were the net purchases during the year? And here's how we would find them. We would take the purchases, minus purchase returns, minus purchase discounts, plus freight in. Those are our net purchases. So here's the cost of where we started. Here's the cost of everything we added. That's everything we could have sold. That's the cost of everything we could have sold. Well, there's only two things that could legitimately happen to our inventory. It's either still here or it's gone. If it's still here, we could count it and find its value in ending inventory. And we could subtract it. Then the remainder is what's gone. That's the amount we have to debit cost of goods sold for. The assumption is they were sold those items. And that's how we figured out the dollar amount for that one big journal entry at the end of the year. Take a look. Same situation here with Lothridge, but now they're going to be using a periodic inventory system. When the purchases of the inventory are made, we do not debit inventory under a periodic system. We debit a purchases account, 600000 and credit accounts payable, 600000 The day we sell the inventory, 
all we do is record the sales revenue because that's all we really know under a periodic system. Remember, there's no barcode scanning in a periodic system. We just know what we charged the customer. But the computer doesn't know what we sold. There's no way of identifying this, what items were sold. We just know what we charged the customer. Debit accounts receivable, credit sales revenue. At the end of the year, we need to determine, well, what is the cost of goods sold? Lothridge begins 2021 with 120,000 in inventory. So that's your beginning inventory. During the year, they purchase 600,000 more in inventory, net purchases. At the end of the year, their ending inventory cost was 180,000. Subtract that and we get beginning inventory plus purchases. So the cost of everything that could have been sold was 720,000. Of that, 180,000 are still left on our shelves to be sold. So we sold goods that cost the company $540,000. The journal entry at the end of the year, this is kind of funky. We would credit our inventory account for whatever the beginning inventory was. We would debit the inventory account for the, be for the ending balance of inventory. So credit it for the beginning balance, debit it for the ending balance. We would close our purchases account. Credit in this because there's only a purchases. There was no purchase returns, purchase discounts, or freight in. So credit the purchases account because we were debiting it as we were buying stuff. And then debit cost of goods sold. And it will all jive out and equal. So we've got our cost of goods sold recorded for the entire year in one big journal entry. We are reporting the correct balance in inventory and we've closed out our temporary purchases account. That's how you do it. That's the periodic system. Whether you like it or not, there's two systems. So again, you need to be familiar with both. You're an accountant now. So cost of goods available for sale is allocated by decreasing inventory and increasing cost of goods sold each time you sell an item. So all we're saying there is every time we make a sale, we're going to debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. Under the periodic system, we don't do that after each sale. We wait till the end of the year and make one big journal entry. The perpetual inventory system, since we're constantly updating our inventory account, allows us to make fairly accurate interim financial statements because our inventory account is up to date. But with the periodic system, since we're not decreasing inventory after each sale, it's pretty hard to make an interim financial statement. And if you try to, you probably have to do a physical count of your inventory. It's more expensive to implement a perpetual inventory system and it's less costly for a periodic because of the technology needed for a perpetual inventory system. When it comes to a perpetual, you should track both how much, how many items you have and the cost of the items. In a periodic system, you only really need to monitor the quantity, how many items you have. So just a brief check between them. Let's, let's test ourselves here. The Golson company uses the periodic inventory system. Information for 2021 is as follows. They had sales of 1,325,000, that's great. We need to determine costs of goods sold. Sales has nothing to do with our computation. So we're gonna ignore it. What do we have to focus on? Remember our formula, beginning inventory plus net purchases. Net purchases are purchases, minus purchase returns, minus purchase discounts, plus freight in. So we would have beginning inventory of 340,000 plus net purchases of 594,000, 600,000 minus 6,000. So we got 340 plus six, uh, plus 600 minus 6,000. So 
the cost of all the goods that could have been sold, $934,000. How much is left? Three hundred seventy. So subtract three hundred seventy thousand. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing this on my calculator that I'm not used to using. So cost of goods sold five hundred sixty-four thousand dollars. And there's your calculation again. So you could see it. What is ending inventory if you're given this information? Well, you know beginning inventory. Remember, cost of goods sold equals beginning inventory plus purchases minus purchase returns minus ending inventory. So it's like an algebra problem, right? You know cost of goods sold, 564000 That equals 340 plus 694 and we're minusing ending inventory to determine ending inventory, right? So 340 plus 694 1034, 564. So we have 564 equals 1034 minus ending inventory. Well, transfer the 1034, subtract it on both sides, just like in algebra. So 1034 minus 564 is a minus 470. Oop, what did I do there? Three forty. Oh, I'm doing six ninety four instead of five ninety four. Sorry about that. So nine thirty four, five sixty four minus nine thirty four I'm betting a thousand today. Whoa, I'm doing something really wrong. Try it again, Lori. Three forty plus five ninety four. $934. Okay. 564 is our cost of goods sold. 934. Okay. 370. Jeepers, creepers. So we're going to subtract 934 from both sides. I, I'm having such a hard time writing this down, but I got the right answer. Let me try it again. I'm sorry. I should have had this done. 564,000 equals beginning inventory, 340 plus 594, which is your net purchases minus ending inventory. Okay. 340 plus 594 is $934. If you take 934, subtract it on the side with ending inventory, and then subtract it on the other side, I'm getting 340. What am I doing wrong? Well, let's see. I know it's 370. I'm finding, oh, let's see. I must be doing something wrong in my calculator. 340 plus 600 minus 6 is 594. I, I so apologize for this. Minus I equals 564,000. I just got to do this. There. I, I was putting the wrong numbers in with my fingers and I apologize for that. I just couldn't do it. So 934 is minus EI Ending inventory equals 564. If you subtract the 934 on both sides, there we go. You're going to have a minus 370 on one side and a minus ending inventory on the other. Well, the minuses will cancel each other out, 370,000. It wasn't as hard as I just made it. So I hope me going crazy here a little bit helped you to see the answer. Okay. 
Physical units include an inventory. So what is included in our inventory? This is very important. So now this has nothing to do with should I use periodic or perpetual? This is, is that an item I should have in my inventory? And what we do, especially at the end of the year, as auditors even, but as the accountant in a company dealing with inventory, we're looking to see items in the possession of the company. Are they ours? The goods that are in transit, do we own anything that is in transit? Are there any goods that we have on consignment or people who have stuff on consignment with us? And something about regarding anticipated sales returns. Let's take a look. So when we have goods in transit, remember goods are being shipped from buyer to seller, seller to buyer. Where the goods are on their way to their destination between the supplier and the company or between the company and its customers. That's what I just said. So the question is who owns the goods while they're being transported? It depends. If goods are being shipped, shipping point, FOB shipping point, the buyer owns the goods while they're being shipped. So you have to identify in this transaction who's the buyer, who's the seller. If it's being shipped FOB destination, the goods are owned by the seller while they're in transit. So you have to identify who's the buyer and who's the seller so you know who owns them. Take a look at this. In December 2021, the Lothridge Wholesale Beverage Company sold goods to the Jabbar Company. The goods were shipped from Lothridge, Lothridge sorry, on December 29th, but the goods didn't arrive at Jabbar until January 3rd. Okay. If goods are shipped FOB shipping point, title transfers at shipping point, meaning the buyer owns them. So if these were shipped FOB shipping point, Lothridge owns them when they leave. I'm sorry. Jabbar company owns these while they're being shipped and they would be take ownership on December 29th. Lothridge would record the sale on December 29th. If they're sent FOB destination, title transfers at destination, meaning the Oh, the seller owns these goods while they're in transit and the buyer will not own them until the goods reach them. So Lothridge still owns the goods while they're in transit because they do not reach um, Jabbar until next year. So at December 31st, Lothridge still owns these and they should still be included in inventory and not recorded as a sale yet. Take a quick check. Barrington Corporation uses the periodic inventory system. Well, that's fabulous. At December 31st, the end of the company's year, a physical account of inventory revealed an ending inventory balance of $80,000. The following items were not, were not included in the physical account. So we need to determine, was that correct? And if it wasn't, we need to add them. How much should Barrington's 2021 ending inventory be? Merchandise, so this is Barrington, shipped to a customer on 1228, FOB destination. The buyer received the goods on 15, so our customer, who is the buyer in this situation, received them the following year. That should be 15 of 22, by the way. Somebody forgot to update the PowerPoint and it wasn't me. <laughs> okay, so who owns these goods while they're being shipped? Well, it's FOB destination, the seller, we're the seller. So that 3,000 of inventory costs should still be re in our inventory balance. So now our balance goes from 80,000, add the three. Let's take a look at the next one. Merchandise shipped to a customer on 1229, FOB shipping point, it arrives at the customer's location on 1-2 of 2022. That should also be changed. Well, in this case, FOB shipping point, the sale occurs for Barrington on 12-29 because the buyer takes ownership on 12-29. So that 1,500 
was not included and it should not have been included. Merchandise purchased from a supplier shipped FOB destination on 1226 arrived on January 4th, 2022. Well, this was shipped FOB destination, so the seller owns this while it's being transported. In this case, Barrington is the buyer, so they don't take ownership until January 4th, 2022. So this should not be included in their inventory on December 31st, 2021. So the correct answer is 83,000. And that's how you have to look at it. And it's very important, especially at the end of the year, to do this um, exercise and make sure the goods that are supposed to be in our records are there. What about goods on consignment? Well, what we wanna be careful of is when we have goods on consignment, what does that mean? There's two things that could happen here. The consigner, okay, is the one who owns the goods. The consignee sells the goods. So, and if you think of it, a lot of these consignment shops have popped up over the last 10, 15 years. And what are they? Well, instead of me, like when I had my son when he was young, instead of me opening up my own little clothing store shop with the extra clothes I had from him when he outgrew them quickly, I didn't have the time, money, or energy to do that. Okay, but I wanted to try to sell them. So what happened was during that time, a person said, you know what, I'm going to open up a store, but I'm not going to buy any inventory. I'm just going to let people bring in their own inventory and try to sell it. I'll manage the selling process for them. So I would take my used clothes to a consignment shop, a consignee. And I would say, would you put these on display in your store? And if you sell them, I'll get so much of the money and you'll get so much of the money. And so that was a better situation for me. Companies do the same thing. So the con co consignment, consigner, sorry, I can't speak, it's Friday, it's late. The consigner of the goods, that's the person who still owns the goods. So in my scenario, that would have been me. So a company could be a consigner and say to another company, can we just put your goods in, our, in your store and see if you could sell them for us? Now they're the consignee. The consignee never buys the inventory from the consigner, they just let them use the space in their store. Who owns the goods? The consigner. So the consigner wants to make sure those amounts are still in their inventory. Okay. So a company may be a consigner or a consignee. If they're consignee, you want to make sure that inventory they do not own is not in their inventory. So goods held on consignment are included in the inventory of the consigner until, until sold by the consignee. Sale is recorded by the consigner only when the goods are sold by the consignee and title passes to the third party. Suppose Pratt Clothing, consigner, ships merchandise to Regal Outlets, consignee. The arrangement specifies that Regal will attempt to sell the merchandise and in return, Pratt will pay to Regal a 10% commission on any sale. Any inventory not sold within six months will be returned to Pratt. Regal obtains physical possession of the inventory and has responsibility to sell the customers, but Pratt, the consignor, is the one who still owns the inventory and risk of ownership. So they keep this inventory in its own records until the merchandise is sold to a customer. That's very important. Sales returns. How do we handle these? When customers return merchandise in a perpetual inventory system, we need to decrease cost of goods sold and increase inventory. 
Remember, when you sold the inventory, you thought it was gone. You decreased the inventory and increased cost of goods sold. You debited cost of goods sold and credited an inventory. Well, if the inventory comes back, you got to put that amount back into inventory, the cost of the original cost of the stuff that came back and credit cost of goods sold because that good is no longer sold at the end of the year. Now, sales revenue will also be reduced when that return happens because your sales went down and accounts receivables will be reduced. That customer doesn't owe you that money anymore. At the end of the period, a company is going to say, and this is required by some new revenue recognition principles that came out. The company is going to say, hmm, of all the sales we made this year, how much do we expect will be returned in total? Okay, so say you had a million dollars in sales and based on past experience, 2% of them are usually returned. The selling price of those, $20,000. So far this year, you've had $12,000 in returns. So you have 8,000 that have not been returned yet, according to your best estimate. The new revenue rules say you should record that $8,000 as if it was returned this year. So you would debit sales revenue, but nothing was returned. So you usually credit a liability like refunds payable because you're going to owe that money in the future. What else do you have to do? You should estimate how much those $8,000 in expected future returns actually cost you. So let's say you normally make a 20% profit on those items. So 80% of the value of your um, sales is in cost. That's how much it costs you. So take 80% of 8,000. So $6,400 of cost of inventory costs is still yet to be returned to you in the future. Well, you should reduce cost of goods sold now for that $6,400 and increase an estimated inventory returns account for the $6,400. Don't debit inventory because it's not back yet. So debit another asset called estimated returns inventory, 6,400. So that's estimating. What are some other transactions affecting net purchases? Well, cost of inventory includes necessary expenditures to acquire the inventory and bring it to its desired condition to sell. Common costs include in an inventory are freight charges, as well as insurance costs during transit, cost of unloading, unpacking, and preparing the merchandise inventory. Remember, purchase returns and purchase discounts reduce the cost of purchases so that you get net purchases. Freight in. These are the costs um, needed to be paid to get your inventory to its location for sale. So this is the buyer paying to have their inventory shipped to them, FOB shipping point. Freight costs are added to the inventory account in a perpetual system, so you debit inventory. In a periodic system, we keep track of those freight costs in a separate freight in account that is closed, just like the purchases account is closed at the end of the year. If you are paying for shipping charges on sending goods to your customer, those are considered delivery expenses, delivery expense on the sale. They're not considered costs of getting your inventory ready to sell. These are costs from selling it. purchase returns. So as a buyer, okay, so you're the company buying the inventory. 
in a perpetual inventory system, if you return any of your inventory purchased, you're going to decrease the inventory account by crediting it. And then either debiting accounts payable or cash. In a periodic system, we don't do anything to the inventory account. We credit purchase returns, which is a contra to the purchase account. And it's also temporary, so it's closed at the end of the period. Purchase discounts. When we are purchasing our inventory on account, so on credit, we may be um, offered credit terms. 210 and 30 could be one. Note the first number always is a discount percentage, so in this case 2%. The next number is always the number of days for the discount from the date of the purchase. So you have 10 days from the purchase to pay to take a 2% discount. The N is no discount or the net amount, the full amount. By the next, the next number, those are the number of days you have to pay it from the date of the sale. So within 30 days. Now you could record your purchases at what we call the gross method or the net method. Take a look. On October 5th, Lothridge purchases 20,000 of inventory and is offered a 2% discount if they pay it within 10 days. Lothridge uses a perpetual inventory system. Under the gross method, they'll just debit inventory and credit accounts payable for $20,000. Under the net method, they assume they will take the discount. So they immediately reduce the purchase amount by the discount. So 20,000 times 2% would be $400. So they'll debit the inventory account for the net or 19,600 and credit accounts payable. So you have a choice on how you want to record when you are purchasing inventory and it has these discounts offered. Lothridge paid $13,720, so they paid $14,000 of the bill within the discount period. Using the perpetual method, they'll debit accounts payable for the full $14,000. They're paying off $14,000 of the bill. They will then take 2% of $14,000 or $280 and reduce the inventory account. So anytime you take a purchase discount in a perpetual inventory system under the gross method, credit inventory. There's no purchase discount account in the perpetual inventory system. All purchase discounts reduce inventory. You paid less for it. And then credit cash because you're only going to pay $13,720. If you're utilizing the net method, remember you already recorded inventory as if you weren't going to take the discount. So you just debit accounts payable for the net that you're paying $13,720 in credit cash. What happens when the remaining balance of 6,000 is paid outside of the discount period? Well, under the gross method, you would just debit accounts payable six grand and credit cash. But remember, under the net method, you originally recorded accounts of payable assuming you would take the discount. So the remaining balance in accounts payable is $5,880, so debit that. Credit cash for 6,000. We debit a purchase discount lost account for the difference, for the discount lost. So depending on the method you use, gross or net, will determine how these journal entries will proceed as you pay off the bill. Covington Mattress buys mattresses from Simpson Manufacturing. Covington purchases mattresses on August 16th and receives a $12,000 invoice payment terms 2, 10, and 30. They use the net method to record purchases. So remember that, excuse me, the net method, you assume you will pay within the discount period. So 12,000 times 0 0.02, 2%, $240. 
12,000 minus 240, you record $11,760 as your purchase amount. What if you use the gross method? 12 grand. You assume you won't take the discount when you're recording under the gross method. Okay. Whew. Let's take a look at this. So inventory transactions, perpetual and periodic system. So we have a couple things here and we're going to create the above transactions are recorded in summary form according to both the perpetual and periodic inventory systems using the gross method. So let's run through these. Um, Lothridge purchases soft drinks from producers, sells them to retailers. The company began the year with merchandise inventory of 120,000 on hand. During the year, additional inventory transactions include they purchased merchandise on account totaled 620,000 and had payment terms. They had free charges they had to pay of 16,000. Merchant, um, and that was paid by Lothridge and that's to get their merchandise to them. Merchandise with a cost of 20,000 was returned to suppliers for credit. All purchases were on account and paid within the discount period. Sales on account totaled 830. The costs of the sales were 550,000 and the inventory remaining at the end of the year was $174,000. So let's take a look. Let's focus, we're gonna have to do both at the same time unfortunately because I can't go back and forth between slides for my recording, but let's take a look. Let's focus first on the perpetual. When you buy inventory, remember you debit inventory, credit accounts payable. In a perpetual system, all changes to inventory are made through the inventory account. When you pay for the freight charge, you debit inventory, credit cash. When you return inventory, you debit accounts payable and credit inventory. Notice, no purchase returns, no purchase discounts, no freight in, not in the perpetual system. When you pay your bill early, and they did, debit accounts payable for the full 600 you owe, the 620 you originally owed minus the 20 in returns, 600 times 2%, credit the inventory for the purchase discount here of 12, and then credit cash for the actual amount of cash you'll be paying. Now the periodic system, you're going to have the same numbers, it's just you use different accounts to keep track of these items. So let's take a look. In the periodic system, you debit purchases, which is that temporary account that's closed at the end of the year. You will never touch the inventory account during the year in the periodic system. When you pay for freight, you don't debit inventory, you debit a temporary account called freight in that will be closed at the end of the accounting year. Credit cash. Returns. Debit accounts payable, credit a contra purchase uh, re account, purchase returns also a temporary account. Any purchase discount taken from paying the bill early is credited to a contra purchases account purchase discounts. That's closed out at the end of the year as well. And there's your numbers though and for everything else are the same and account names are the same. Finishing up. That sale at the uh, uh, during the year we debit accounts receivable credit sales revenue. For the perpetual system, we debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory for the cost of the goods that were sold. Because we make those journal entries as we go. In the periodic system, the day of the sale, you debit accounts receivable, credit sales revenue. At the end of the period, ah, remember, we closed the temporary accounts that we were keeping track of purchases purchase returns, purchase discounts, freight in. So let's take a look. We know our ending inventory is 174, debit, in, debit inventory 174. We know we started the beginning of the year with 120 in inventory, credit inventory for 120. Credit your purchases account, let's reset it to zero. Credit your freight in, they both had debit balances. Take a look at your journal entries. 
debit your purchase returns and purchase discount accounts. Reset those to zero. And then debit cost of goods sold for 550. Now, if you're saying, well, how'd you know it was 550? Oh, you just plug it. You can go back to your formula. Beginning inventory plus net purchases. In this case, net purchases would be 620 minus 20 for purchase returns minus 12 for discounts plus freight in of 16. Then subtract your ending inventory of 174 and that gives you your cost of goods sold that you debit. That's the difference between the two systems. That's a great example to see them side by side.